Hello, my friends. As one of uh, as this Monsignor at the church I grew up in, I was raised Catholic. I'm not Catholic anymore, but there's a Monsignor that was in my church growing up that I will never forget that used to say, with his hands shaking like this, my dear boys and girls, my dear friends. And I will add, my dear non-binary pals, welcome. Okay, I'm done. Welcome to part 15 of God of War. With, I don't know what I'm doing. Welcome to God of War Ragnarok with the Therapist part 15. It's great to have you here. We've been waiting at the gates of Alfheim. You've been waiting for this stream to come out. You've been waiting for a long ass time. And you're like, shut the hell up, Dr. Mick, and just let's get to it. I will, I will do that in a second. All I ask in return is that you put a little thumbs up on this stream, that you leave a comment, that you follow the links in the description. Do all that stuff. You do that. Chef's kiss. Love you forever. You're awesome. And subscribe to the channel. If you're watching my playthroughs, please subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference. I want YouTube to know who I am. Okay? So, I appreciate you all very much for being here. I'm looking forward to what today has in store. So, let's make it happen. Uh, mortars, I would say yes. I got a lot of other stuff I'm trying to pay. Ah, here we are, where we left off. Make sure we're good on volume. Freya? Freya, it seems like, I, I gotta be honest with you. I don't know how I how I feel about you walking around with with bare feet in the snow. Just so that we have a refresher here. Mimir spoke with the elves Bela and Bigvir while in Freyr's camp. They spoke of an elven sanctum of forbidden knowledge deep in the eastern desert of Alfheim. It may contain valuable resources for our journey. That's what we're doing. Ah. It looks as though the Light Elves sealed off this section of the Barrens. Why? Luckily for us, a very considerate goddess has enhanced our magic chisel, and we can unseal it. My, that is lucky. Sure the forbidden is. Forbidden salves lay beyond. Contested territory, according to Bela, and another storm to endure. Mecky. Hoya. Let's get back on the sled. Come on. Doggos. Yeah. I like how that lizard's just chilling there. There's like no reason for Sony Santa Monica to put a lizard there. And they're just like, yeah, put a lizard there. Makes it more lived in. Oh shit, what is, is that the jellyfish? Alright, keep riding. I remember when Freya and I traveled to this realm as children. The desert was healthy and full of life back then. I can't help but fear that era has ended for good and our efforts here are futile. It's a fair concern. Healing this land will take more than a pair of singing half -gupa. But I have to believe in the long run, we're doing right by Alpine. <laughs> I sure hope so. Ooh, this is neat. Well, best we start looking for a way underground. Keep a lookout for a cave. There's a lot of caves. <laughs> So we got to get another jellyfish out. It would seem. Sarah, thank you very much for the prime sub. Uh, 
I will be... This one's going to be about two hours long, back to... Jewelry. Oh? Put it on one of my horns. Let's see if I can pull it off. <laughs> no. <laughs> a rather lovely piece of jewelry crafted by one of Freyr's Light Elf supporters. It seems to be a bracelet, hand-formed to fit Freyr's wrist, which introduces one question. Why was it discarded? Was Freyr so inundated with gifts and jewelry that he simply couldn't find a place for it? Or did he perhaps wear it for a time only to cast it off? Possibly in anger or shame, or some combination of the two, once he sped back to Vanaheim to stop Freya's wedding. Oh, that's... Yeah, Mir, you could pull that off, dude. Might be a little heavy. I think you can do it. Search for clues about elven history. How about I break your pots? Take your hex over. I'm pretty sure there's I'm pretty sure there's a guy named Zelda that does this all the time. out how many of you just freaked out at me for saying that huh how many of you watching this right now on youtube you heard me say that go oh no oh no no dr mick no i know what i'm doing oh, the library an archive of knowledge no sign of the light elves for now maybe they've left for the day and we can browse at our leisure Open ceiling. Interesting design choice. Scholarly. Oh, it's just the examination of temporal significance. Ooh. Yes, give me that. This evening, I found myself musing on the scent of a book. When the paper's fresh, it carries the gentle notes of the plants it came from, light floral with a touch of sweetness. As time passes, the pages age. They take on their brittle tan, a tear forms, a tear forms from any force stronger than the softest of touches. Wait, what? What am I reading? They take on their brittle tan, a tear forms from any force stronger than the softest of touches. The scent hardens, crisp at the beginning, moving into an earthly musk that left behind from the dust, desert air, and insect feasts. To these ephemera, nearly as impermanent as ourselves, do we entrust the collective knowledge of our elven histories? Is this venture foolish? I concede the fleeting nature of existence, be it a flesh or scroll, yet I would not trade the pleasure of putting ink to page for all the treasures of Alfheim. The Council. <laughs> Ooh. A little incense going on here, huh? So, these are the Valing schematics, eh? You know of him. Aye. One of the most gifted dwarven smiths around, until he developed a conscience, anyhow. Uh, this would fall under. What would this fall under? I want to I want to know what that man this codex is a mess. The game is amazing, the codex is a mess.
Like, I would love to know... Yeah, I don't even know. Yeah, like Dragon Age... Co I mean, really, any other codex. This, this one's particularly bad. Somebody just left their money on the table? Okay. Mm. Mm. Rules of the Sanctum. All visitors must observe strict silence inside the library, even in the vestibule, passageway, grand hall, mezzanine, and upper circle. No books are to leave the premises for any reason under penalty of death. Jeez. Transcriptions of any material within the library are expressly forbidden. Damage to library materials due to carelessness, including creases, folds, annotations, and such like, even accidental, will not be tolerated. Comestibles, libations, and liquids of any kind are forbidden. Visitors must check in with the present librarian before leaving the library. Failure to adhere to the rules will result in immediate punishment to be determined by the present librarian. That is very interesting. Either they're afraid of the spread of knowledge or they want to control who has it. Or both. That's kind of fascinating. In this big old elaborate library. Look at me swinging my chains in it! What are you gonna do? You gonna penalize me with death? Huh? Is that what you're gonna do? You gonna you gonna come in here? You gonna say Kratos? Kratos, come away. You think you can chain me up? I've already got chains. Okay. Alright, I got that out of my system. I was never a big fan of libraries. If there was one part of Greece that I loved destroying, it was the libraries. These texts alone are not enough to end the Elven War. But restricting their access only serves those who wish to prolong it. Taking a page out of Odin's book. Aye, quite the advantage for the Light Elves. This has real-world implications. I'm not going to get into the political implications of this, but I am going to talk about some of the psychological implications of this. One of the ways that people can maintain power and control in a relationship, engagement, etc., is to have more information. Like when people say knowledge is power, it's true. The more knowledge you have and the less knowledge somebody else has about something that you're trying to tackle together, the more power you have. And that power is something that sometimes people will use for good. Maybe it's just like, okay, I just need to have the information because it's easier for me to keep track of this and I will keep you in the loop. But even that creates a hierarchical structure of, I have information that I will disseminate to you. But this is where sometimes what you'll see as a means to control people or to abuse them is to withhold certain information and control the flow of other information such that you curate a certain narrative, story, and experience for somebody else. So it's very important, not just from a macro perspective, but also from a micro perspective, to consider that there is so much power in knowledge and in knowing what's going on. It's, you should be generally skeptical of anything that uses smoke and mirrors and is evasive of providing you information because what it means is that you're not as informed in your decision-making, which may mean that you move in a direction that is to the benefit of somebody else at your own detriment. Always try to get as much information as you can so you can operate on as many known variables as possible. Thank you for the 359, Lathia. I appreciate that. That's very generous. Look at how, like, lit up these are. I've not seen any of these like that. All, like, holographic Pokemon cards. You're stealing all the riches in here, too. Treasure map, forgot tower. Find a location from the map. It'd be really funny if we found one of those treasure maps sometime and it was like next to the treasure chest and it was because somebody else found it and discarded the map. <laughs> what 
is this? The Consul's Journal. This book is sealed, but there is an inscription. The Consul. Big Veer spoke of an exile of the same name. Odds are he'd like a gander at that particular text. Man, for how, like, locked down this place is, it wasn't very locked down. I wonder if we're going to get attacked on our way out of here. All this knowledge of their ancestors, their shared history, poetry, just sitting here, forgotten. The Arbiters of Knowledge. We are the caretakers of truth. Arbiters of knowledge, protectors of this repository of enlightenment that stretches back to our earliest writing, ancient is the sands. It is our sacred duty to protect our elven learnings and prevent the possible spread of it to those who cannot reconcile the wisdom found within these walls. The benighted masses cannot be trusted, cannot be expected to assimilate these truths. They lack the intellectual fortitude to absorb and accept the divisive nature of certain revelations. This suppression is not cruelty, nor is it an attempt to control. It is mercy, pure and simple. Never forget that. If you're listening to me read that, and you're like, I have no idea what the hell Dr. Mick just read, that's by design. Language is incredibly powerful, and the way that we communicate is really powerful, and sometimes people in positions of power will use very flowery, uh, erudite language as a way to block out the uneducated from their ability to comprehend what it is that that is saying. It's a really good way to create boundaries. And in a way that makes the people who can't understand this feel really shitty about themselves and kind of holds down that they're stupid. So it's like, it's jargon. And you see this in academia in real life a lot. You see a lot of people in academia write with these gigantic words and they make these big crazy phrases and it's part of actually what creates a sense of separation from the beneficiaries of certain research and the people who are creating it. Now, there are some fields where using big giant words is totally necessary. Like when you're talking about like medical research and probably like engineering and like some of the like hard sciences and stuff like STEM stuff. Yeah, I mean, big words are going to be a part of it because we're talking about complex things. But when we're talking about human dynamics, when we're talking about like behavioral research, when we're talking about any kind of research that needs to be disseminated to the masses, you create a real chasm for yourself when you use these gigantic words. And I was talking about this on a recent stream about how the real hallmark of intelligence is the ability to synthesize complex information simply and to make it understandable to people who don't have a pre-existing knowledge of what it is that you're talking about. So we often will read these big giant things that these academic people write in books and all this sort of thing, and you think to yourself, well, I must be stupid. That person must be smarter than me because I can't comprehend what they're writing. That's not always true. In fact, one of the, uh, I'll share this story really quick as an aside to really hammer this point home. When I was in my PhD program, there is a person who is a pretty giant figure in the family therapy realm. And he would write these anthropological books and memoirs and stuff. And they are so flowery, flowery and complex in their language. He is notoriously difficult to read. And when you're in your master's program and when you're first learning about it, a lot of the vibe is always like, well, it's just because he's just, he's just. And you just kind of assume that you're just too dumb to understand what he's saying. When we got to our doctoral program and we started to really critique stuff, I will never forget that we were having a conversation about this person and the person who was teaching the class was like, no, he's just a shitty writer. He's just terrible at getting his ideas out. Like his ideas aren't that profound. He's just terrible at writing them out. He uses these big giant words and it shuts everybody out from being able to actually understand it. But like, it's not actually that profound. And we had like two lectures about it. 
And it was awesome. Like we had these amazing conversations about like why this particular person is generally regarded very highly, but, and while there are some good ideas in there, it's not even remotely as exciting as you actually think it is or as deep as you think it is. It's written either because that person just simply does not know how to communicate well and uses these big giant words because they haven't really thought about who's actually gonna consume their information or it's code. It's essentially code for trying to shut out people who are not educated enough to comprehend what it is that you're writing. And so when we read this about the elves, there's some real funky shit going on in terms of like creating separations within the ranks of, of enlightenment and knowledge where you have these elves that are writing in this big flowery language as a way to shut out the people that they probably need to control. So instead of people being able to comprehend what these elves are writing, what they have to rely on is the people who disseminate that information. And if the people who disseminate that information have an agenda, it creates a real problem. So the way that this gets translated to some extent in real life is that we might have big, gigantic, complicated policies that scope is beyond our individual ability to comprehend. And then you have certain people who filter that information and disseminate it to the masses and will disseminate it with a particular angle or spin on it as a way to influence people who don't otherwise have the ability to disseminate that information. So we're talking a little bit more from a sociology perspective here with the elves than we are a psycho psychology uh, perspective, although the two have an interplay there. But it's very interesting to read these articles from the elves and see this happening in real time. And I had so much experience with that in academia where it was like, oh my God, like, why is this written this way? One of my favorite professors one time said, why use, why use quarter words when nickel words will do? I've, that's always stuck with me. What a waste. Agreed. So these people are writing smart for the sound of for the sake of sounding smart and shutting people out, not for the sake of actually making sure that the masses have access to good information, and that's a real shame. Checking out the flowers, Freya. Here's a librarian would like a word? Of course. Lata Thalmog. Sounds like she wants that journal back. No. Steel strike! No. not recovering fast enough. knowledge away oh hell i wishes to read this journal we are taking a look
Damn. I'm gonna talk about some power shit right there. It's like, yeah, librarian. I'm gonna take the book. I'm gonna walk out of here. You're gonna say to your you're gonna say to your higher ups that you were peeing. And when you came back, the book was gone. That you put Ralph in charge. And they're gonna say, I don't remember Ralph. And you're gonna say, yeah, nobody remembers Ralph. He's not a very memorable guy, but he was in charge, and I don't know where he went. But, but it was it, Ralph was supposed to watch it. And then you're going to say you're sorry, that you lack the oversight, that you'll do better next time. And we're and we're not going to we're not going to say anything else. All right? Taking the book. Maybe I'll bring it back if you're nice, you don't follow me. Ralph. Not Rolf. Ralph. <laughs> I'm impressed. Thought you were going to end her. When last we traveled here, after Faye passed, I killed an elf of great importance. The ramifications were dire for his people. I do not wish to make the same mistake twice. That's cool. That's... Way, way, way early on in our playthrough of this game. I think it was in like part three. We're in a boat. And we were talking about how you cannot change the past. You can only use the past to influence the decisions you make in the, pre in the present, which will eventually affect the future. This is a great example. I know it seems pretty obvious, but this is exactly what that looks like. Kratos had an opportunity there to kill that elf. And instead of doing so, he drew upon his learned experience of having done that before to make a more informed decision about what he was going to do in the moment, which influences the future. It doesn't make up for what he did in the past. He's still accountable for that decision. But when people talk about how do you do better going forward, it means that you really learn from your experiences. And it's not just saying, I learned from that. It's making better decisions going forward using that past experience. And this is just a beautiful example of that for Kratos, and I give him a lot of credit for that. <laughs> That's awesome, Pineapple. In real life, the librarian would have won. It's true. Nobody messes with librarians. People really underestimate how difficult of a job that is. You have to get a master's degree to be a, to be a librarian. <laughs> All right, let's go find the jellyfish. Gotta take out the caster first. What you like? Got me my treasure. Shattered ring. Wow, we got a lot of good stuff there. Got an amulet enchantment. Man, oh man. Let's kick this down.
I'm going through here. Going through this elven door. A token. A badge of honor. The elves made a few of these. They'd hang them up outside their dwellings. Show their support for my brother. Give me the codex for it. Come on. Where is it? Man, I hate this. I want to read this stuff. Guess not. Oh, he's a big boy. Holy shit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, I am like way hurt. Holy shit. Whoa. Not paying attention. That? That's going to be you in a second here, big dog. Wow, they hit hard. Holy crap. Wow. Killer app, thank you very much for the prime sub. Dust of Realms. Man, those guys are tough. He's maybe the hardest thing I've had to fight so far. It's under goals. Oh, cool. Okay. Thank you very much, Blue. Uh, we found token. A token depicting Freyr's likeness, crafted by a... F and four, those elves who supported the young god in his attempts to find peace. At the height of Freyr's popularity, these tokens adorned more elvish homes than they did not. They represented that one thing which is an invaluable in small doses, outright deadly in large ones. Hope. Locked. It requires two keys. What are they keeping back there? That's the beauty of a locked door. It could be anything. Monsters, treasure. No, in our luck, it'll be a bit of both. Oh, let's find those keys. I see an entrance. Yeah, we'll do that later. I want to look at other stuff. Big whiffer. Okay. One Get him.
First try. For, for, first, first, first try. First try. Yeah, we got it. We do have to free another jellyfish, which I think is going to make the storm go away. So I'm being a dumb dumb again and doing this while it's all blowing around. So maybe we will go do it. We came here to find that book, not to do the jellyfish, but Atreus is going to be sad that I did this with Freya instead of him. Or maybe he won't. Maybe Atreus will feel good about it appreciate our work here in the desert. I wonder if he knows how poorly this realm has fared in his absence. Aye. Hearing the Song of the Sands again is a rare privilege, even if it's only a solo act. Or a duet, once this Hopkufa is free. <laughs> this architecture... It is not of the Dark Elves. An abandoned ancient settlement, by the looks of it. Built long before the Lightwell's creation. More hive matter as well. I'd say we're on the right track then. Man, that's creepy. Look at that. Oof. So I got to break through that from the other side. There we go. Whoa, what's that? This kind of hive material is sensitive to sound. How odd. It's a sphincter. Oh God, are we inside of an animal? No, we're not inside of an animal. It's got real sphincter vibes, though. When I last came here with you and Atreus, I assumed the absence of Alfheim's light was an aberration. I didn't realize it was covered by hive matter. Aye. And as far as the Dark Elves are concerned, it's that light column in the center of the temple that's the aberration. Just look at how old some of these surfaces are. Far older than the light well, or even our trapped half giver for that matter. That's quite the empathetic perspective, Mimir. Well, dangle from a burly god's backside for a few winters, and you'll find yourself looking for all sorts of new perspectives. I like that. I mean, you want to talk about the ultimate compliment about your empathy. You get a compliment from Freya. Woo! <laughs> Queen of Empathy. Yeah, get up here so you can shoot this. Well, there you go. Interesting. Okay. But I want the loot. Enemy, to your left. 
Silver. I got more hack silver than I know what to do with. old rock and chuck it man that's cool I love that oh shit oh shit oh shit or don't do what Frey tells you to do you Step right in it. Step right in it, Ryan. Light elves don't often travel underneath the Baron, do they? The territory changes hands often in Nalfheim. Or so it appears. Big Veer did mention that these ruins have historical significance for the Light Elves. I assume they're only here to keep intruders out. Well, at least they try. <laughs> I suspect the corpse below would disagree. Huh. I know what it says. Sacrifice. No sacrifice in vain. A corpse lay below this one. I wonder if the poor soul wrote it before expiring or if it was written by a friend who caused said expiration. Oof. Oof. Can't climb this, too steep. Okay. Coming, half kufa. Good eye. Let's continue, shall we? It was super hard to find, Mimir. I'm I'm quite surprised myself. I was able to do that. It's real convenient how those bouncy things are right next to those tentacles. Oh, what do we have here? Yeah. Yeah. Down we go. See ya.
Badass that she like pulls out her Valkyrie wings. I hope freeing these half goofas will allow them to breed again. It was a dazzling display once. The skies of Alfheim filled with their song. I imagine it's the lack of fresh light that's caused this pair to grow abnormally large. No use in having babies if there's nothing for them to feed on. Trying to protect their children from a harsh world. I can relate. Hey, me too. Isn't it cool how we can connect, connect over that, F F Freya? Sorry about your son, though. Sorry I ruined that. Sorry. Every time she brings it up, it's like, yeah, protecting children. Yep, well, protecting my child. the most fun. Dick. Oh, he didn't even have that much. Whatever. Fine. Still got what I needed. Tentacle busting. I'm okay with that. I can do some tentacle busting. comprehend the choice they face once free. What choice do you speak of? The life cycle of the Hafkufa. In order to breed, they must pass on their light to their children. And without light, they will die. I suppose that's all any of us can hope for in the end. That our death has purpose. That we can live on through our children. Well, given another chance, I know what choice I will. Which one? So I am generally not the biggest fan of when people try to lead and bait others into asking them curiosity questions and expanding on something. Like if you have something you want to say, just say it clearly. 
just speak it. Don't do the whole like lead on super obviously in the hopes that you get engagement out of it. Now that said, in this type, in this situation, Freya did that. If Kratos was interested in trying to facilitate some additional intimacy, and I don't mean romantic intimacy, I mean relational intimacy and closeness with Freya, that was a really great opportunity for him to engage some curiosity. To follow up by saying something like, well, what would it have been? Or say more about that. Like, what do you mean? It is amazing the amount of intimacy you can facilitate in a dyadic relationship if you're willing to ask questions. And if you're willing to just sit with that person and show them that you care about what they have to say about something. Now, that might be difficult for Kratos to do because he's still trying to feel Freya out or he may have his reservations. But if you are ever in this type of situation and you want to facilitate more closeness, you would do very well to ask a follow up question. And do I like kind of identify that that person was walking a bit into vulnerability and that you have an opportunity to learn more about it rather than say, oh, yeah, me too. Just ask a question. Also speak, but if you're Freya, speak directly. Like if you got shit you want to say, say it. There's some twilight stone. Right. This is kind of interesting. So. So I do have to get three. If I had to guess how these jellyfish got here, I, I would have to guess it was probably Odin being a dick. with here so I can't imagine this is overly complicated Could be wrong though half goofas are known to burrow yes but burrow into the bristly thorns that we're having to dig them out of Really interesting, actually. Because this, is gonna, right, it's gonna get stuck there. So, Okay, this is, uh, this is getting kind of interesting here. This is the second time I've gotten stumped on one of these. I do not want help, but... Oh, there we go. Wow, that's, uh... That guy is hidden. Good. Almost there. Okay. That thing was real incognito. 
makes me wonder if there's another one of those chilling around here somewhere. Oh no, that just okay. That just didn't. All easy from there. Well done. Time to set it loose. Hi. Back to the surface then. Neat. Oh boy. Big boy. in many of Freyr's blessings, I imagine. That's all my brother's tributes. Would you prefer we hang on to them? Do what you will. If Freyr didn't bother taking them when he left Alfheim, he wouldn't mind us selling them to the dwarves. Okay. ceremonial pipe. Given Freyr's temperament, one can imagine this saw a great deal of use. Not that I blame him. It said that some of Alfheim's flora was particularly well suited for recreation. Just one more thing Fimblewinter took from the realm, I suppose. A shame, too. I was rather interested to learn whether or not my current bodily situation would allow me to reap any hallucinogenic benefits from Alfheim's herbs. Ah, what's up, Widgie? Good afternoon. <laughs> was a blacksmith whose king commanded him to construct a box that could contain all the evils of the world. But no metal could hold such a power. So the blacksmith used the flame Kratos, of... is this a story meant to ease my grief? Perhaps it is just a story. A way to pass the time. I appreciate the sentiment, but... Well, your stories... What about my stories? I wouldn't exactly call them a comfort. Fair. Mamir is the better storyteller. Now, don't sell yourself short, brother. You've come a long way from the days of laconic fables. It's okay. Finish your story, Kratos. The blacksmith's daughter was the key to unlocking the box. He died trying to protect her from those who would open it. Well, at least it's a relatable story. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, where do I want to start here? Human relationships and the negotiation of needs in those relationships is way more complicated than we all like to think. Many people go through the world believing that 
everybody is supposed to know how to interact with them in the way that they need all of the time. And if you are that type of person, you are going to miss out on people doing their best to communicate empathy in the way that they know how. So one of the coolest ways to have depth in your interpersonal relationships is to continually work to keep in mind the context from which the person you're engaging with comes from. And the way that this played out here between Kratos and Freya is an, ex is an excellent example of this. Kratos never learned how to directly display empathy. He, that's not what Spartans do. When you're a Spartan, you're raised to be objectified and militarized. That's your entire goal. Empathy has no place in war and in the military when you're trying to be an absolute sociological death machine. But Kratos has learned over the past several years, in particular with his wife and then with his son, that empathy is something you need to have in order to connect with people, that people value being heard and understood. Well, Kratos doesn't necessarily have good language for that. Perhaps it's incredibly uncomfortable for him to do that. I tend to err on the side of it's a skill that he doesn't really possess. So the way that Kratos tends to empathize with people, and we've seen this multiple times, is by telling stories where the core essence or moral of that story is something that could be transcended into the context of the person that he's engaging with. In this case, maybe it's the, the Hafkufa, or it's Freya, or it's both. So this is a genuine bid from Kratos to try to connect to Freya. Even if he is just trying to tell a story to pass the time, Kratos is a man of so few words that if he is actually using words and telling a story and initiating engagement, that means he is doing something. He is trying to connect with you in the best way that he knows how. Now, does that excuse any time that he does that in a way that's hurtful to other people? No, but what it does mean is that we cannot expect that Kratos is going to engage in empathy and in interactions in a way that we would traditionally want somebody to do until he learns that skill. So when Freya tries to stop him because she's assuming his intent, that's her in some ways saying, this isn't what I need right now, but it's also her making an assumption that that's what his intent is, is to meet a need of hers. And so when he comes back and says, well, maybe I'm just trying to pass the time. Maybe I'm trying to connect. Freya being as unbelievably empathic as she is and has been throughout this game, I think recognizes in that moment, wait a second. Kratos is not trying to misfire. He's not trying to be patronizing. He's actually trying to connect with me right now. So let me engage with him as if he's trying to connect with me. And when she does that and makes that connection, she says, finish your story. He finishes the story. Maybe it's not exactly what she wanted to hear, but she can take it for what it is at a process level, which is him trying to connect with her. It's not about the story. It's not about, like, he just wants to talk at me. He wants to connect as any other person would. He's just not as good at it. Freya is on the complete other side of the spectrum as Kratos is, in terms of her ability to connect with and empathize with others. So the short version of this, to summarize it, is work to understand the context of the people that you are engaging with and use that context to better understand what it is that that person is trying to accomplish when they engage with you. Maybe it's not exactly what you want, but maybe if you can see past exactly how they're doing it, you can see that what that person's doing is trying to connect with you. And if you want that person to try to connect with you, appreciate that they're trying to do it in their own way. And then maybe after you work with them to say, hey, I just want to let you know, I love that you're willing to tell stories here, Kratos, because it's, it's a way of you empathizing with me. Hearing those stories sometimes is off-putting. So let's maybe figure out another way to communicate that when it comes up for you. That's the ideal way to move through that scenario.
It's just, it's not, nobody knows exactly what you need. And nobody's going to hit the mark 100% of the time. The extent to which you're willing to be flexible with that and give people the benefit of the doubt is going to take you a long way in your interactions. And I think it's why Kratos and Freya have been able to repair their relationship as quickly as they have. Think about, so I, I'm just to belabor the point for a second for everybody who's watching the YouTube VOD and for people who are here live on Twitch, just to belabor the point. Think about the difference in the way that you hear Kratos tell that story. If you take the assumption that he's trying to connect and empathize versus if he's trying to patronize and moralize. It completely changes your expectation of that conversation and it changes the way you hear it. Which is so important. It is why we have to be careful not to assume intent all the time. Sometimes truly a person is really just trying to figure out how to connect and they're using the tools that are in their toolbox. Like Kratos, so Freya's toolbox is one of those gigantic toolboxes that you can get at Home Depot that's like two stories tall, has 500 drawers. They're all beautifully organized. It's got every single size and thing. You could, she, her empathy toolbox is the Taj Mahal of toolboxes. Kratos has a fanny pack with a screwdriver and half a hammer in it. So when he's trying to communicate and connect with people, that's all he's got. So Freya might say like, hey, I got a spare, I got a, a spare screwdriver here. Let me help you out. I'm going to throw that in your bag. I'll teach that to you. But that's all he's got. So to expect him to have the precise tool that's necessary is ridiculous when we actually understand his context. Now, it doesn't mean that Kratos gets to be a dick to people. If Kratos continues to misfire and he's off-putting and he's pissing people off, he needs to know that too. It doesn't mean that we just always let everything slide for Kratos because he doesn't possess the knowledge or the background. If Kratos is actively working on it and he's actively doing what he can to try to learn how to connect with people, we can give him the benefit of the doubt. If Kratos is shutting all that out and he's like, nope, I am who I am. You just have to deal with it. That's a problem. I mean, he could say that, but it's not going to be conducive to facilitating meaningful relationships in any way, shape, or form. Uh... Oh, Dave, what's up, man? Nice to see you streaming again, sir. I appreciate you bringing folks over here, man. Thank you so much. Also, uh, Killer Rap, thank you for the sub. I don't know if I thanked you for that, so thank you. Also, I'll take, as I climb this wall, I just want to say thank you all for being here, whether you're here live on Twitch, whether you're hanging out with me on YouTube, however it is that you are consuming this content. Thank you so much for making it a part of your day or night. I really do appreciate the support. It's awesome, and uh, I love seeing more and more folks coming in here and hanging out and getting some out of, something out of this. So, much appreciation. To you. All right, out of here. It appears we've overstayed our welcome in our pipe yet again. Oh, what's up? <laughs> Time to end this storm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Indeed we have, Skog. Indeed we have. YouTube's growing a lot faster than Twitch is. But it's very cool. I never thought I'd see the day that I had more YouTube subs than Twitch uh, followers. So, I'm pretty honored by that. safety. Even these creatures know. There is little choice for a parent. You are not alone. <sighs> I'm not, am I? And now neither are they. Are we watching them bang right now? Thank you, Kratos. This land sings once more. We've done good here. And now the one on the left falls into the refractory period. <laughs> No rush to leave yet, is there? Who knows what kind of adventures await us in a freshly lit barrens? Endless love. Okay, so what I... <laughs> what I love about that conversation where Kratos says, regardless of my stories, take solace in the fact that you did what you could. That is awesome growth for Kratos. That is Kratos then responding to the context that I was talking about five minutes ago for Freya. So he sits and he reflects and he thinks, why was I telling that story? Oh yeah, I was trying to make a point. I was trying to connect with her around this. So he then cuts through it and then says to her, this is why I was telling you that story. Here it is. He's being more direct with her, more in touch with what it is he's trying to do and more directly empathizes with her experience, which then leads to her softening and saying something like, thank you, Kratos. So, I mean, immense character growth on his part as it relates to that too. He's reading context clues. He's paying attention to people that he cares about, which is awesome. He, he, he gets kudos for that. He should get kudos for that. We all should get kudos for that when we make that kind of effort to understand the people that we're engaging with. I love that. Oh, look at the little spermies flying around. They sacrificed themselves for their children. As we watch that, that's a big old metaphor for I'm sure at some point what's to come. No pun intended. of my brother. How quaint. Investigate the monument to Freyr. 
That's odd. The runes are dark. What purpose does all this serve, other than a testament to my brother's vanity? Difficult to say without an inscription. But it looks like the elves built this place together, light and dark. Which means this would have been their first act of cooperation in generations. A far cry from lasting peace, but perhaps it served as a monument. One that symbolizes the potential for peace. Could he have been telling himself the same thing a little bit at the same time, too? Maybe he relates to how she feels in a way, wants to experience it differently than she had? Oh, absolutely, Shelves. I, absolutely. I, I think I think one of the things that makes all of this so profound between Freya and Kratos is that Kratos can absolutely empathize with Freya. Kratos is viciously protective of Atreus. So he understands what Freya was going through with Baldur. He understands the lengths that you'll go to in order to try to protect your child. He absolutely is empathizing with that. And so to some extent trying to reassure her, yeah, could we say that that's potentially him trying to reassure himself? Yeah. Yeah, we all we all do that from time to time. I carry this crystal because it's fun. Makes me feel strong. I'm gonna set it down right here. This statue may have survived Freya's absence, but a truce clearly did not. Monuments are useless to those who ignore their message. He didn't create a truce through diplomacy. His godhood, his very presence is what healed this land and allowed peace to take root. But once he left, he had to have known what would happen. Well, he had good reason to leave. Some jackass convinced his sister to marry a madman. Aw, oh, a little self-deprecation there, Mir. Decent way to try to disperse the tension. Yeah, yeah, let me get ahead of this. I know it was my fault. <laughs> you said monuments are useless. Why restore this one? It was hidden for some time. Perhaps now it can serve as a reminder. Aye. Nothing reminds people of their history like chiseled, well-lit marble. <laughs> Right about that. Oh, okay. Deal with that later. Right? Normally we'd have to provide our own. Perhaps slotting a crystal on the opposite side could shed some light on this mystery. No, oh, you dog, you Mamir, you dog. I'll bet you I'm gonna have to put. I'll bet you I'm gonna have to put that down so that I can walk up. Okay, we're just gonna do this now. We're gonna, we're gonna go over here. set that down over there because I'm going to have to go get another one.
Would you look at that? Pop this down here. Take a walk over here. I enjoy the side quests in this game. They're very well done. Right into his nipples. The ring of crystal shards glow. Looks like we can read the inscription now as well. Ah, uh, you just got to tickle his nipples with some light a little bit, huh? And he reveals his secrets. In honor of the enlightened one, may his gift of light shine eternal. In honor of the enlightened one, may his gift shine eternal. His light serve as a beacon of harmony. Peace endure among the elves as we forever bask in its radiant. Ah, gift of light. The light from the crystals. It is in the sand now. Would you look at that? Freer's gift endures after all. Or should I say, his presence? You are not funny. <laughs> I don't know, Kratos. I thought that was pretty. <laughs> I thought that was pretty silly. I say so myself, man. light in the desert isn't enough to make it last before i met Faye, i could not imagine a life of peace after her death in our travels to jotunheim i found peace on my own it remains my responsibility to make it last perhaps the elves will find peace again one day even without freya's guidance his presence continues to guide them whether they realize it or not Well, there's, a, there's like two different things that I could talk about here, uh, which I really like. Um, first is from like a sociological perspective. When they acknowledge that the peace was tenuous, even with Freyr's presence, it's because you have to be very careful not to over associate one specific person or thing with unity. When they look at Freyr as the great uniter, there is some level of deference of accountability where maybe the light and the dark elves say, well, the reason that we're together is not because we're working very hard to reconcile our differences and coexist, but because we've downloaded our hope for that into one person. And the reason that that's a problem is because if you put all your eggs in that basket and then Freyr leaves or shows himself not to be what you think or whatever, the entire thing crumbles because you're not actually doing the work. All you're doing is saying, well, this one person is capable of uniting us all. The reality is you should probably use Freyr as a catalyst 
to do the actual work that you need to do in order to ensure that this lasts a long time and that you're not entirely reliant on Freyr. And to have this giant monument to Freyr, to an extent, is a reflection of how unstable elf relations are. Because when he's not physically present, we have to create monuments and symbols so that he's in our psyche because he's the only thing we associate with peace. That's, that's not good. Peace should be something that we associate with the hard work that we do in order to coexist and understand and reconcile differences. That's where it should be loaded. And it's been kind of hijacked by being loaded into one person. The other thing that I think is really cool within this space is when Kratos is talking about how it's his job to carry on that piece for himself after he found it post phase death. And I really love that little piece of accountability. Like that's essentially Kratos saying that he's trying to do what I just talked about, which is that he's recognized that in order for me to continue to find my purpose and inner peace and the things that I want for myself, I have to take an active role in that. I get that he also probably means peace for the realms. He's talking about a broader role that he has as it relates to the gods and Ragnarok and all that stuff. But I think he's also talking about himself and needing to find ways to come find peace and acceptance of what his life currently is. Faye is no longer available to him. Atreus is. I want to make sure that I have meaningful time with my son, like when we went and freed the first half Kufa. So it's kind of cool that Kratos is willing to look at the accountability piece of finding that inner peace because that is his responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. We can't rely on other people to bring all that stuff to us all the time. We do have to put the work in. Kragums, thank you very much for the five months. Appreciate it. It's okay to have symbols. We just don't want to overdo it. Otherwise, you start to, again, I am I am not a fan of deferring too much accountability to others. Like you got to take accountability for your shit. Yeah, back to the story of your brother. You said the elves saw him emerge from the Lake of Souls. It's true. I don't know whether he worked his charms at that point or they just assumed him to be a great deity. But of course, he hadn't made this journey in search of responsibility, so he didn't stick around long. Enough. We will continue later. Well, the massive door we found earlier. That door required two keys. Aye, so it did. Let's keep looking then. Kind of waiting for Brock and Sindri to show up somewhere. Well, that was the hard one, so now let's find the easy ones. Favorite dwarf brother? Uh, probably Brock. I'd say it's probably a pretty cliche answer, but God damn it. I can't really gauge. 
car that is. What's up, Strider? Got that guy lit up. There's probably one more, probably to the left here. Yep, there it is. There we go. I don't know what that heart is. All right, two or four horns. Go through here. We can bring these two animals back to Vanaheim, or Midgard even. Becky and Vanna could use the company. We have kennels. It would not go well for them. Once a predator becomes accustomed to a land, it is cruel to move them. I suppose you're right. It just seems lonely out here. It is peaceful. They have each other. It is enough. Aw, Kratos, are you saying that you having the people you love around you in short supply is good enough for you? Freya, here. Freya? Freya? Uh, hey! A dawn bloom. You have an interest in botanicals now? No, I have an interest in you as a person, which means that the things that you are interested in that I associate with you are things that I'm going to make an effort to take interest in because that's a way that I can better connect with you as somebody who I care about and want to have along as an ally. There's real power to that, friends. You don't have to like the stuff that people like, but finding ways to be interested in it and show that you care about it because that other person cares about it can go a long way. One, to you discovering some cool stuff you might not have otherwise cared about, and two, to actually facilitating some intimacy with the people around you. Uh, or if you want to say it like Kratos. Huh. Another sleeping troll, courtesy of the dwarves. Yarg Stormer. Casualties caused 43 dwarven, 22 other. Method of imprisonment, not slumber. Prison location, Alfheim. Date of release, not applicable. It's a troll. 
Rehabilitation isn't possible. Feel free to use a rousing relic if you're desperate to get your skull caved in. Imprisonment overseen by Alvis Stonefoot, Svartholfheim, otherwise known as he who is running out of patience for writing these reports. You there. I would like to fight you. <laughs> Feel free to use a rousing relic. A rousing relic. Ooh, that's cool. We'll invoke the storm. I'm down for that. All right. Well, I don't know what room. Hmm. Figure that out later. You know, Freyer loved to breed Gulan pups in Vanaheim. I wonder if these two are the descendants of the Gulan he brought here long ago. That explains how they got to the desert. Another gift for the Dark Elves. Oh, cool. I can just walk over these. Good sure enough. It's been a bit since we've unlocked the mysterious door. Excited, brother. Mm. <laughs> Classic. Mm. Second too late on that. Oh, these, I'm guessing. Attack! 
Mythic Ruby, thank you very much for the sub or for the raid. I appreciate that. the other one guessing the other one is a little more complicated oh no the other one's even easier damn it the opposite of what I thought That was cool. A fun fight. Got a lot of stuff off of that. Ever written poetry of your own brother? No. Well, ask a stupid question. <clears throat> Trip. Poem of quiet melancholy by that poet Gvasi. Alone, yet together, close yet apart, our long scarves a tether. Cooperation in art, speak without word, quest through the land, glide like a bird, draw names in the sand. That's journey. Love it. Oh, I gotta burn that stuff off. Journey was great. Played it. We played it on stream a while back. Ooh, I wonder if her. Perfection. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, 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 gimme. Oh, sled dogs. Hello. Let's go. Yeah. I wonder, how'd these two pups end up yoked to the sled? Ever try flying in a sandstorm? I imagine Freyr showed the Dark Elves that Gulon could be trained to pull a plow. They must have found new uses for them once the sandstorm arrived. I imagine they're now bred to aid in traveling the surface. And 
not happy. Oh, shit. What up, big dog? He's big. He's bad. He's cool as hell. Okay, and I ran right into him because I'm a dumb dumb. whether to be impressed or horrified either way it is over now gravel belly found this drake in the deserts of alfheim behind a door i've been expecting treasure or a new area or a desert to explore but was instead met with a beast blue markings on its head were like nothing i had seen before it could be considered beautiful were the creature not trying to dig its tusks into my flesh yeah i mean he's pretty cool Dragon Claw. A sharp claw from a fallen dragon. It can be used to craft dragon scaled armor. Hell yeah. That's pretty cool. I'm into it. You did good work in Alfheim. map just to make sure I think I've done all there is to do here Freya will you continue that story about your brother he stumbled into Alpine became a legend and left essentially so still the legend of his manifestation was passed along through the ages it even endured after the great division remembered by light and dark elf alike so when at last he returned, he was uniquely situated to gain the trust of both sides and help to create a truce. The problem was, both sides trusted only him. So the peace could only last as long as he stayed around to keep it. And with the long war dragging on without an end in sight, I suppose making any kind of peace was an irresistible notion for him. Even if it meant having to rule. Oh my gosh, it's almost like I called it. <laughs> nice job, Sony Santa Monica, making it very realistic. Oh boy, the way that that would have gone down. 
Please just reach these. Damn it. Oi, vey. I gotta say, I'm not the biggest fan of these. Like, this grab this chest <laughs> don't backseat Tincho I'm gonna have to chuck this at a weird angle, I think. Yeah. Oh shit, I pulled it back too soon. Yeah. There we go. Boom. Alright, that's taken care of. So much to do in these little areas. Like, I love, I love how packed they are. All right, let's get out of here.
pretty sure there's something I'm supposed to do with those tombstones. But... Ooh, yeah. Here we go. Ooh, here. This is like destiny when you ride the sparrow through the tunnels. Only all cats and harnesses could be so well directed. Yeah, no kidding. All right, rolling on up. If I don't have it, you don't need it. Anything for Freya? Great her sword. To your liking. Kratos? Whatever you need, I'll create. And do it. Alright. Special items. for this okay so can this lock be opened without damaging the book the elves in Freya's camp wish to read it oh a locked book you say how mysterious and an elven lock intriguing if your friends in Vanaheim want it I'll get it open and pass it along with your regards <laughs> a lovely couple Thanks, dude. Appreciate that. Ooh, hard war hands. Yeah. Okay. Good shit. And that is unfortunately where I have to leave us tonight. So uh, we are going to hop on the sled and we're going to head back to the uh, couple in Vanaheim. And we do part 16. Thank you all for coming out and watching part 15. It's a little short because I had to do an afternoon stream and I don't have a ton of time to do it today. So short and sweet, but we got some good stuff in there. It was enjoyable. It was nice hanging out with you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day or night to watch this. Your presence means so much to me. On your way out, leave a like, leave a comment, follow all the links down in the description. I post go live announcements on Discord as well as my stream schedule, so come hang out with us on Twitch sometime. Would love to have you. Again, another big shout out to Sony Santa Monica for crafting such an incredible game. It has been so enjoyable to play and, anal and analyze this. And I hope if anybody from Sony Santa Monica watches this, that my playthrough is doing what you were trying to accomplish justice. Uh, share this stream with somebody if you feel like they would enjoy this playthrough. I appreciate that very much. It's a great way to spread the word. If you're binging, I'll see you in part 16. If you're waiting for the next one to come out, I'll get it out as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate you all. Catch you on the next one.